Making pictures, so simple, but man, is it hard to master. I put together a list of five great tricks to turn your everyday stuff into epic or inspiring photos. Hi, I'm Adam and welcome back to First Man Photography. We're gonna jump straight in to number one in just a second, but before we do that, this video is sponsored by Squarespace. If you need a domain name, a website, or an online store, make your next move with Squarespace. Right, we'll start with a very basic one, but it's something that often gets ignored, even by the very best photographers. We all very naturally think about what to include in our frame, a beautiful tree, a lovely rocky foreground, or the stunning mountains away in the distance, but of equal importance is what we decide to exclude from it. As photographers, we don't have sounds, smells, or words to play with. All we have is what we place within the four walls of that frame, so things should not be creeping in there by accident. Being intentional about where we place objects in the scene and how they work in relationship to each other is what good composition is all about. We'll talk about how to do this a bit later on, but when composing an image, it's all too easy only to focus on the subject and have all your attention concentrated in the center of the frame before you push the shutter button. Take a moment and check around the edges for those unwanted elements and make the necessary minor adjustments. With landscape photography though, this it's just not always possible because we do not control our subject or the things around us. It's usually on occasions like this when I decide to use the crop tool either in camera or in post-processing and by excluding portions of your native aspect ratio, it then enhances the remaining elements in your frame. Also, don't be too quick to clone things out in post either. One editing trick I learned from Joe Cornish is that if you do have a distracting element in your frame, rather than cloning, just try using a brush to remove some of the brightness or saturation, two things that very much draw our attention. Another way to use this idea to your advantage is when we strap on a long lens. Not only does the compression change the relationships inside the frame, but it also lets us pick out stunning elements from the much wider vista. I love these types of images because they also activate the viewer's imagination to fill in what's happening outside of the photograph, adding to the whole experience. Last week on Twitter, I asked, if music has chords, does photography have an equivalent? I got some fantastic replies back, and I think my favourite took things down to first principles, where basically both musicians and photographers are making their artwork by recording wavelengths, one of sound and one of light. With music, we might start with a simple chord progression, add in a bass line, then the drums kick in, and finally the melody soars over the top, and these layers build up to form the eventual composition, which is rich and full and a delight to our ears. The same concept applies to photography though, but instead we layer up visual elements. We use the artistic elements to craft a visual symphony. I've made several videos about this now, but lines, shape, form, value, color, texture, and space are our instruments and how we apply them and how they interact together are what determines the character of your final image. Problem is though, with music, we instantly know when a note is wrong. It makes us cringe and we can hear something is not right. But with photography, things are not always so obvious. And very often people can't figure out why their image doesn't feel right or how other photographers are able to craft great compositions every single time. It's by putting in the time to learn about the artistic elements and principles and the various rules of composition that will undoubtedly unlock new areas of creativity for you. Can you be a great photographer without learning this visual theory? Of course you can, of course. That's when people say, he's got the eye. 
But it's a complete myth when people say it can't be taught. You can absolutely learn it. As photographers, perspective is one of our most effective tools and it is by adjusting our perspective that allows us to arrange the objects in the scene to our liking. A common mistake is when people think that zooming in changes perspective. Perspective only changes when we move the actual camera around. So let's demonstrate with our trusty old friend Optimus Prime here. He's gonna stand on this tripod and not move at all. We'll move the camera around and see how an image of the same subject can look completely different simply by changing perspective. Uh, let's also put a little highlight on him to make him look good. And then we'll start with this slider shot. Notice how as the camera moves around, Optimus stays in the center of the frame, but the background behind him changes. Knowing this, we can then decide which parts of the background we want to include in the frame and exactly where to place them. It's extremely powerful and also works the other way around too. If you know you want the distant mountains in the frame, you can then freely move around and find a suitable foreground in front of you. It's not just side to side either. Let's grab the camera and look down on Optimus. Suddenly the floor becomes the background of the image. It looks pretty crappy here, but this photograph shows how we can use it to isolate a subject, create a nice negative space and use it to our advantage. Now let's get down low and point up at Optimus. He still hasn't moved, but now the ceiling has become the background. I used this method just the other week when I was shooting the uh, the bluebells in front of the Medusa tree. Really pleased with this image. So start moving around to find those new perspectives. It's good both in life and photography. Right, I've got another couple of really good ones to come, but as you know, this video is sponsored by Squarespace. Now, if you are a photographer, running your own website is the best possible way to share your story with the world. And with Squarespace, it's just so easy to get set up. And unlike social media, you control how your images are presented. You start by using one of their beautiful templates, put some of your own images on there and a bit of your text. And then before you know it, you will have a unique and beautiful looking website. You don't need any coding knowledge either, and it will dynamically adjust to look perfect on all types of screens, but particularly your phone, which is very important in 2023. You can start with a simple gallery, but as you grow, you can then upgrade your site to an online store where you can easily start selling anything like prints, books, or calendars. Do people still sell calendars? I don't know. It also now has a member section if you want to run a sort of Patreon type subscription service. And in the unlikely event that you run into trouble, they have award winning customer service. I've used Squarespace for years and years now and have never looked back. So go to squarespace.com to start your free trial today or click the link down below. And then if you like what you've created, use the offer code FIRSTMAN to get 10% off your first purchase. One of my all time favorite photography quotes is when Ansel Adams said this. And I'm guilty of creating a cliche, which I use very often, is that in actuality, the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> negative is like the composer's score. All the information's there. And then the print is a performance. When Ansel Adams said this, in modern terms, he was also talking about the post-processing stage, but it's still a quote that really resonates with me. The digital world is fast, instant, and it feels chaotic at times, and the stream of amazing digital photographs is almost overwhelming. But slowing all this down and bringing your photograph back into the physical world is one of the most fulfilling experiences a photographer can have, especially at a gallery or when being viewed by someone. 
it most definitely is our performance. And if we don't make the effort to do this, we'd be a bit like the musician who never plays a gig. I've got lots more videos coming up about printing your photos. So please do subscribe and hit that notification bell. But one of the best pieces of photography advice I ever received was to shoot photos at the scene like you are making a print rather than just a digital image. What this does is stops me rushing my compositions. I make sure everything is technically sound. I'm not desperately trying to shoot everything. And I would rather walk away with one print worthy image than 10 average ones. It really does help me to focus on quality rather than quantity. Another thing I can't stop thinking about is that printing your photos is the ultimate form of backup. We used to secure things digitally, but we're now at the point where we should be backing things up physically. In a world where images are becoming increasingly AI generated, story, human story, is going to be more important than ever if we want our photography to have any relevance at all. But can you tell a story with a single photograph? Well, absolutely you can, but it doesn't have to be a fully formed script in your mind when you actually shoot it. I often shoot things just because it feels right. But a single photograph can tell a rich and nuanced story. And we shouldn't forget the old cliche of a picture paints a thousand words. Pretty much every photo tells something of a story because it's capturing a snapshot in time and freezing it forever. It shows what was happening, who was involved, and possibly sometimes even why, such as a wedding. I like this image here because it was the end of a good day, but the wooden style you see there does not exist anymore. It's sadly since been vandalized and instead replaced with extra bricks sticking out the wall. So the story has since become even more relevant. Next, we have the subject of a photo. If there are people in the photograph, it becomes really much easier to tell the story. We can see their expressions, actions, and interactions, all of which suggest a narrative. We can see laughter or sadness, and it immediately allows a connection to those people. The context and background of an image can suggest a story. Photographs of lone trees are popular because we love the story of resilience, standing alone against all the odds, but still surviving. Or an old picture of a rundown building can tell a story of decay or desecration in this case. Then we have the story of the person behind the camera, the way the photo was taken, the perspective, focus, composition and lighting. It's the photographer's interpretation and we can direct attention around with the elements and set mood using the artistic principle and that all contributes to the narrative. Then finally, we have the viewer themselves. They bring their own interpretation and emotions to a photo, adding more layers to the final story. And that's why we should put our work out into the world, because we just don't know when our photos are going to connect and resonate with people in ways we never imagined. <coughs> Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, subscribe, support the channel by buying my book if you want, and I'll see you on another one very, very soon.